Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Solidity Fridays. Today, I'm joined by Gareth Larkin, a developer at Linum Labs, and we are going to be looking at Universal Router via Uniswap. Hey, Gareth, how are you doing? Hey, hey. Yeah, cool. I'm so excited to be back again. Um, last week was really cool. Um, so, yeah, I'm really keen to do another Uniswap addition to the Web3 world ecosystem. Mm. I think it's going to be really cool. Yeah, I was saying to someone yesterday, Permit 2 was so cool. Um, that would have been enough for me for like a few months for to think Uniswap's amazing. But then they also have this universal router. And they released know, it on the same crazy. day. Like, wow. Uh, same day. You're, no, that is hectic. Um, but yeah. yeah, really excited to look into this. Yeah, cool. So if you don't know what universal router is, uh, I also didn't read it until um, recently. It unifi unifies ERC20 and NFT swapping into a single swap router. Uh, it can be integrated with Permit2, and users can swap multiple tokens and NFTs in one swap, so you can save on gas fees quite greatly. Um, That's really cool. Another reason why I want to look at Universal Router this week is we did Permit2 last week, and I really want to start using it in my contracts because it's amazing. And we spoke about how you could maybe integrate it into your contract, but we didn't look at a practical example. And, mm. and Universal Router is integrated with Permit2, um, so we get to see how they actually implemented that in a smart contract. For sure. Um, interesting. This doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> the sidebar. Yeah. Weird. Anyway, we'll just scroll down. Cool. Uh, they say we've integrated Permit 2 into another exciting contract. The Universal Router is Uni Uniswap's next generation router. So we start, we'll start using this Universal Router instead of the old Swap Router. Yeah. It unifies token and NFT trades into a highly flexible, gas-optimized, secure, and extensible Swap Router. The Universal Router significantly improves product and user experience, which is why it will become the default Swap Router for all Uniswaps in the near future. They are talking a big game, eh? Like yeah, they are. throwing away a lot of big words that are, um, yeah, let's hope that it, it lives up to the expectation. Mm. I'm sure it will. Um, some of the people who contributed to it are some of my GitHub heroes. <laughs> <laughs> so the swap route is taken to find parameters, swap route, maximum slippage, and swap recipient. And then they execute swaps against your desired venues, which can be Uniswap pools, or NFT marketplaces, or any swap venue. Um, swap routers are optimized to find the lowest prices and execute them at the lowest gas cost. Um, Uniswap also have something called a uh, smart router, and yeah. it's, it it does this like calculation for you. The best so I wonder. Route and stuff. Yes. Um, so I think maybe because that's more of a back end thing. Maybe you could implement swap smart router with this universal router, and the smart router will look at universal router and see the. Um, the best route. It would yeah, be quite that... cool if they could just implement that like all in one. If they could just be a place where you said, okay, I need to swap in a contract, I need to swap, I don't know, BTC for ETH, and boom, it literally just uses oracles and stuff and looks at the best route and just creates a swap for you. Mm. Um, that's like future goal, though. Yeah, maybe that's the combination of universal router and smart mm. router, but it might also just be. Um... Let's see. Let's see if Universal Router does some of that stuff. Um, so, so there's, yeah. yeah, there's two inefficiencies <clears throat> of, of current swap routers. Um, they usually only support either NFTs or ERC20s, so like coins. Mm. Trades that involve both currently require multiple transactions, which can be very expensive. Um, and then also, because swap routers are responsible for transferring user tokens, users must approve every token on first use, making them costly to upgrade. And also just the mission for the UX. Ah, so this is why they integrate the permit too, so that you also mm. don't have to now, you know, obviously approve the swap beforehand. You can just Permitted. maybe give it like a, a permission for that block to use it. And then, yeah, that's quite cool. Mm, I wonder if they were making this and they're like, oh, this approve steps lame. Let's just make yeah. something like permit two. <laughs> <laughs> Um, do you want to read how Universal yeah, Router unifies um, swaps? So, users can execute multiple token swaps on Uniswap V2 and V3 and buy NFTs from multiple marketplaces all in one transaction. So, um, it uses three different input tokens. Um, 
it swaps on Uniswap V2 and V3. So using a split route, that's interesting. Wow, that split um, route is going to be cool to look at. But yeah, that's going to be very interesting. And then it, perform, it performs an ETH to uh, wrapped ETH wrap and then buys an NFT on OpenSea. Interesting. Okay, so the entire flow can be executed as a single transaction. Wow, so, that's so optimized. I, that's times crazy. <laughs> what a time to be alive. So, so if we go with the bottom route first, um, two and a half thousand die is sent into Uniswap V2 and converted into 0 0.5 wrapped ETH. Um, second transaction, 0 0.1 ETH is sent in and wrapped into wrapped ETH. And then in the top transaction, a thousand USD is sent in to Uniswap V3 and converts to 100 DAI, which they then jeepers. Then then they split, they use a split route with 77 DAI going through Uniswap V3 and 23 DAI going through Uniswap V2 to get it into um, wrapped ETH and then combine to form one amount, um, send that to OpenSea and they bought a crypto coven, coven NFT. So that's incredible. Like wow, I'm really, like I can't wait. In one to transaction, see I mean. Yeah, in one transaction, that is unbelievable. Wow. So in one transaction, they bought an NFT, used Uniswap V2 and V3 to swap USDC. They've wrapped ETH and swap die. Crazy. I, I'm also almost a bit speechless. I almost don't believe <laughs> it. But I, I mean, obviously, I'm, <laughs> it's true. But wow, wow. So they they've integrated with Permit Two so that the users. Um, approve permit two and pass their signature through. Um, we spoke about the signature last mm. week. Um, so they send the signature to the router and you abstract the token approval flow from the router contracts. Uh, so yeah, then developers can deploy new versions of the Uniswap universal router without requiring users to send a separate approval transaction each time, which is, this is where it comes back to permitting for multiple contracts, which is crazy. Um, it allows the router or any contract to remain immutable while allowing new features to be added in the future. So that's that's really, really, really cool. Mm, that's amazing. Um, it's a non-upgradable, unowned, and open source contract, which is amazing. And it's on five chains, the biggest five, I'd say. Um, and then there's an SDK for integration, which we can look at. Um, and then there's a bug bounty. I looked at the bug bounty for Permit 2, and it's uh, not for optimizations, interestingly enough. It's only for... Um, different tiers of uh, vulnerabilities vulnerabilities yeah uh, um, okay. yeah maybe uh, should we look at the SDK or should we just dig into the code and if we have time see the SDK or do you want to look uh, at the docs yeah let's see first the docs if there's anything important we missed before we jump into the code because I think the code could be quite intense It's really, really too like, crazy um, improvements yeah. that they've released. Um. I don't um, know if there are docs for it. Uh, I just found this route to just to get us here. Oh, no, they was... were. Because um. there's permit two. Uh, Maybe you can only do it with SDK. Maybe. Swap widget? No. Interesting. Interesting. Um, let's look at this SDK and just see the readme. Um, no. I think we just jump into the code then. Cool. Interesting they used Foundry. That's cool. Um, but it's, it's a lot of TypeScript as well. Cool. Um, <clears throat> so let's maybe read this high-level overview in the readme of the universal router. <clears throat> so as we know, it's an ERC-20 and NFT swap router that allows users a greater flexibility when performing trades ac across multiple token types. But you, you can just do multiple ELC20s in a single transaction if you want. Yeah. 
You don't have um, to do it in FC. Well, so splitting and interleaving of Uniswap trades, purchase of NFTs across eight marketplace, uh, marketplaces, pastoral fills of trades, wrapping and run, unwrapping of ETH. I wonder if we'll get Universal Router 2 that uh, wraps and unwraps a, a bunch of tokens. And then, yeah, time bounds. I'm sure they're already working on that. Yeah, I'm sure they are. Um, this is going to be important, I think. Transactions are encoded using a string of commands, allowing users to have maximum flexibility over what they want to perform. With all of these features available in a single transaction, the possibilities to avail yeah, available to users are endless. <clears throat> so um, I yeah. think this, this encoding a string of commands into one transaction, that's how they do the, it's all in one transaction. So they look at each thing you want mm. to do and code it into a string of commands, then put that into a transaction and decode it probably as the transaction executes. That's my guess. Yeah. Um, so it's really just one contract, universal router, that's all, and all of its dependencies. The purpose of the universal router is to allow users to unify, uh, yeah, swaps with NFT, yeah, in a single transaction. Um, Cool. The, let's look at how they do this um, command encoding. So calls to universal router.execute is the entry point to the contracts, provide two main parameters, bytes commands. So commands in form of bytes. Um, you know how with uint, if you don't say 256 at the end, it, if you just say uint, it is Exit, 256. No. Um, bytes does it make, automate, automatically make it 32 if you don't specify, or is it 64? I think it's 32. I don't actually know. Okay, we'll I really see. have no idea. Um, but yeah, so so what, every part is a command. That's interesting. So I wonder if they, because that would mean there is a limit on the amount of commands if they don't specify mm. how many parts. So um, each yeah, individual byte is one command the transaction will execute. Okay, and then there's a bytes array of inputs, an array of byte strings. Each element in the array is encoded parameters for a command. Okay, oh, okay. So, so you have one command, and, and a then parameter. you can have many parameters. Okay, um, cool. And it's in a dynamic are... array, so you can have as many inputs as you want. And um, they're using bytes, string, strings in the form of bytes here because it, it saves gas and space. Yeah, big time. So I've stopped using strings, actually. I've switched to bytes, and I think Gareth mm. is too. I've seen that. Um, Commands yeah, that's interesting. I is the command that will use input I as its encoded input parameters. Okay, so then yeah, commands I plus sense. one will probably use input I plus one. Yeah, exactly. So they would also have to be the same length. That'll probably be a check that get mm. performed. Yeah, good point. Um, through function overloading, there's also an optional third parameter for the execute function. A deadline, which is a UN256, which is obviously for timestamps. Oh, yeah. The timestamp deadline by which the transaction must be executed. Transactions executed after this specified deadline will revert. Mm. That's cool. very nice. Cool, and cool, and that cool. could also be nice because if you want to swap, like let's say you have a feeling that the price of WEATH is going to go up, you want it to quickly do this before the price goes up. Um, yeah, you can set a deadline. Yeah. Or it's also nice maybe you want to set a deadline so that um, it'll be. Cool. I wonder if like it'll be cool, like maybe an adjustment if you wanted to set, like you obviously know like what the current. I mean, if you're doing a swap, you probably know what the current rate is. Like if you could, kind of put a max limit on the swap, mm. um, to stop a swap happening. If in that execution time something goes wrong and the price sparks, you know you don't want to be left with not a lot. Um, so I wonder if that's possible. Yeah, let's see. Something to think about. Um, oh, here we go. Because we were wondering more about the command bytes. So here's how it's structured. Uh, each command is a byte one containing the following eight bits. Wow. So it's it's a byte one. Um, no, but that's for each command. There's a byte one. Oh, I see. Because bytes is several commands. Exactly, yeah. I see. So each yeah. command is eight bits. Exactly. With a following. So it's got a single bit four. flag. Yeah, flag, which is a single bit at zero index. Two bits for what's R? Uh, scroll down. Reserve space. space. This will easily allow us to increase the space used for commands or add new flags in the future. Okay. 
Okay, Yo, they're they've got plans. <laughs> the aliens at Uniswap have something up their sleeve. And then the command is a five-bit unique identifier for the command that should be carried out. The values of these commands can be found within commands.sol or can be viewed in the table below. Cool. We will look at that now. Uh, should we look at this flag? Um, what is the signal? Whether or not a command should be allowed to revert. If F is false and the command reverts, then the entire transaction will revert. But otherwise, if F is true and the command reverts, then the transaction will continue, allowing us to achieve partial fills. Hmm. If using this so flag... They... Be careful to include further commands that will remove any funds that could be left unused in the universal route of contract. I see. See, that's interesting to me because then what happens if you have like a deadline and the deadline's passed, but you've set F to true? The, con will, the command will revert, but the transaction will continue. So one of two things can happen, what you just said, or maybe they say in their code somewhere, if F is true, but the deadline has passed, or the deadline, like maybe this this trans this transaction being allowed to revert, can be overwritten um, by this revert, and if this reverts, the whole thing reverts. I'm just trying to figure out why you would want to have partial fills. Um, maybe um, we'll see that in the code somewhere. Why you would want it? It's basically like a force, like you're forcing a, a transaction to go through, even if it needs to revert. Yeah, something will revert, but then the rest goes through. Maybe you're in mm. like a desperate rush or... <laughs> um, I suppose they're just allowing for all possible edge cases. Mm, I think, because obviously, you know, swaps <clears throat> are either done through Uniswap or most often through a smart contract. And mm. if someone's coding a smart contract, they know when it might revert and maybe they want to have a partial full. Maybe yeah. we'll see more later. <clears throat> cool cool so um remember we have these four with this, this five bit unique identifier mm -hmm. so these are all five bits i don't know what seven is but from the first one is uh the v3 swap exact in so what that is is i mean we won't go through all of them in detail but um this mm -hmm. means the they use the exact amount of input tokens um so you specify how much output. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Whereas the next one, the second one, is ex exact output swap, um, which means I want to swap some USDC for this exact amount of DAI, and then they use the minimum amount of possible USDC, um, but they make sure that the exact amount of DAI comes out. Mm. Um, we looked at the next two last week, so we want to explain that. Um, I'm not sure what a sweep is, but I'm assuming... If, if you don't have an idea, Gareth, it might be like um, to put this transaction with another transaction. Like it might be a command but sweep between two commands. But we'll see. I'm maybe. not actually sure. I'm hoping we see that in the code. Yeah, there's a commands.sol. Maybe we should look at that actually first. Yeah, I reckon we go there. And then here they have their, um, their eight marketplaces. Um, Open scene one. Um. Note that some of the commands in the middle of the series are unused. These gaps allow us to create gas efficiencies when selecting which command to execute. Okay, I believe them. <laughs> yeah, cool. Um, oh, and then let's also look at how the input bytes are structured. Structured. Should I have changed that to a D as in a PR? The and then I can say I contributed to Universal Router. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. There's an, also an open Zeppelin one where there's a small typo and I'm like, I really want to fix it. And then I can say I contributed to open Zeppelin. <laughs> <laughs> um, input by its string is merely the ABI encoding of a set of parameters. Cool. Depending I on wonder the if command, we should just go through the code because I mean, we'll see I don't this. know how. Yeah. Okay, cool. And then we can refer back to this if we don't understand what, oh wait, no, there was only two of them. Okay, never mind. I thought it was going to go through every single example. Okay, maybe we can go through it. Okay. Um, no, I, I think you're right. Let's just look at the code. I just want to see okay, cool. um, for de more detailed breakdown of which parameters you should provide for each command. Take a look at the dispatcher.dispatch function or it's going to be the ABI definition mapping in planner.ts. Okay. Wow, that's cool. Okay. Okay, cool. Develop a document documentation to give a detailed explanation of the inputs for every command will be coming soon. I guess it's it's so much that they just thought they would release yeah. it and then detailed yeah. stuff because there is this planner.ts. Which I also want to look at. Let's let's get going so we have some time. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, I'm just cool. 
Um, it's quite interesting that their um, libraries are just out in the wild. <laughs> yeah, casual. And but then they still have lib. Hmm. I wonder if this V3 core is uh, the one at the 0 0.8 branch or if it's the... Um... That's V2. Oh, sorry. Um, okay. But anyway, no, that's not something we need to know. Okay, contracts. Uh, should we look at the universal router or do you want to look yeah. at um, the commands.sol first? Yeah, let's do commands.sol because then we can know kind of what's going into the command. Cool. I don't know where uh... it'll be. Oh, he has dispatch oh. about so. Um, oh, wow. They have re entry lock as a, um, its own contract. And then they have a rewards collector. Um, modules, maybe? No. Um, cool. <clears throat> <clears throat> uh, literally just has. Yeah. You just call the library. You can say command oh, type mask, and then it just gives you the the that five bit. Um, yes, um, bytes one command. Yeah, that, that's nice. So you you can actually see the names. Yeah. <clears throat> so you can yeah you don't have to know the actual. You yeah, know, remember five bit zero x zero nine yeah. or something. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, cool. And then they so have these command place holders at the end. Mm, so these will be the banks, the C port. Venues. What's foundation? Do you know? Mm -mm. Is that the Uniswap foundation itself? Maybe. I think it might be. But we'll see. Um, cool. Such a fan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is anything in us in libraries we should maybe look at? Constance, recipient? Nah. I think that's chilled. Do -do -do -do. Cool. So it imports dispatcher, and when they use it, maybe we must look at dispatcher. Then there's the rewards collector, router parameters, and router immutables. Okay, so so everything important is actually in the base directory. Constants, commands, I universal router, the interface that is, and then um, the reentry lock. Hmm. And they inherit a lot. Um, it's it is yeah root, that's what I'm also looking at root, a universal root interface that's expected dispatcher rewards collector and reentrancy lock and then they start with a modifier interesting so there's yeah, no state cool. variables here because they they're probably in constants yeah do you that want to look at any of these Gareth before we dig in <clears throat> or do you want to just dig uh, in and look at these when they get I used I kind of want to know what I kind of want to know what Routine mutables are, to be very honest. Okay, I want to know what dispatch is. So let's go to base and look around a bit before we come back. Okay. This... Yeah, let's look at those two. Oh, root parameters. Okay, so this is where they're storing the parameters. I see. Wow, very interesting. Um, okay, these are just... And, and this is how they... These... So here, they, they, this is how they're making the wraps. They know the with 9 address. Exactly. Um, and maybe later they can do like wrapped Bitcoin and stuff. Like in their say, next version of this, they might have more router params. They'll have I'm more I'm surprised addresses, this fits, yeah. to be honest. Um, I yeah, was in a struct with many like addresses and I got a stack to deep error. But what they might be doing is because they're using Foundry, they might have via IR set to false. So it's not no set to true. Which makes it a bit longer to compile, but it makes it that um, it, 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 the stack is bigger. Yeah, it makes the stack bigger. So that's probably what they're yeah. doing here. Okay, so they've got the parameters. Um, okay, then they're just basically creating variables for them. Hmm. Um, and the contract. And they're so immutable. They looking up. Um, now it's just setting all the parameters. Okay, cool. So that's what it does. It's basically just creating instances of these mm. marketplaces and addresses and stuff. Yeah. Okay, okay cool. cool. Now I understand. So that's now I know great. why they would need that. <clears throat> and now we can humor me and look at the dispatcher. <laughs> so 
It's quite interesting. She's a dev at Open Zeppelin, and it's just quite interesting that she's done. She's in all these contracts. Um, mm. <clears throat> doing stuff with Uniswap. I know it's open source, so maybe she's just. But it looks like she was like actually asked to work on it when it was being incepted. <clears throat> okay, so there's the swap routers. Um, interesting. It's an abstract contract, so it's not using all of one of these things. <clears throat> Custom errors. Um. Dispatch takes in a command type and inputs. Okay, so this is what we saw earlier. Um, oh, this is what decodes and executes the given command. Mm, okay, so, okay, so we encode the commands in those bytes with those cons no, the commands.sol file. Yeah. And then this is what decodes them and <clears throat> takes in the inputs and executes them. And it probably sh does that sweep or something to put them together. <clears throat> um mm, yeah it does definitely execute as well v3 swap exact input v3 swap exact output like go down a bit more yeah it literally is just their sweep oh. um token recipient announcement inputs payments dot sweep so what's quite interesting is there's something here at the top that says <clears throat> using recipient for address yeah so I don't know if we should look at recipient, but you need some water there, Tam. I do. <laughs> do <you> wanna... <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll go get some water. I'll, I'll I, I have this. some water. I'll just <clears throat> okay, cool. Um, yeah, so basically just a bunch of if statements, kind of looking at what <clears throat> this is basically how they obviously decoding the the command tab, and then mm. calling the the actual function based on the command tab. So. That's quite interesting. I like, always wonder if there's a more efficient way to do a whole bunch of ifs. Uh, yeah. Obviously, I, Solidity, I we don't support this. switches. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I always wish for a switch. Yeah. I used to hate wish them in Java, and now I wish for switches often. <laughs> <laughs> so it's quite clever that they go if, if the command is less. So they look at this group of commands first, and then if it's yeah. one of these. Um, Otherwise, it'll be 0. Oh, 0. 0x09. 0. Maybe we just look at one, um, and then we see... Um, oh, okay, so they know for this kind of thing <clears throat> that the inputs and these, um, what is it that they put in? Inputs and command type. Yeah, so if they decode the input, they know what they're going to get out, basically. Okay, so they decode the inputs, they know what they're going to get out, which is, in this case, an address recipient and amounts in, amounts out minimum, because remember, we're doing an exact input, so this has yeah. to be fixed, but this can be anything above exactly. the, the path, uh, interesting, and then the payer is user, is, is a bool. So then that bool probably, yeah, here, address payer is a ternary. So they say That's payer is unit. Um, so what they do is if the payer is the user. Um, then message.sender is the payer. Yes, if that's true. And if it's false, yeah. then address this is the payer. Yeah. So basically, if a payer is the sender, then if the payer is a is a um, EOA, then mm -hmm. it's message.sender. Otherwise, if it's contracts, just address this. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. I don't think we need to go through all of these, but I mean, I might... It's such an interesting way to do an if statement. Like, I'm trying... It's... Like, is it more efficient to do it that way? Um, for what simpler... do you mean with, with this? With ternary. No, the... Oh, ternary. Yes, ternaries are more gas efficient than an if statement. Okay. So because, it says if this yeah. is true, then this one. And if it's yeah. false, then this one. I'm just trying to feel um, like it's interesting, but it obviously gets a bit complex if you have like more hectic if statements. Yes. Um, um, or an if else. For yes, so that's what I was thinking. But um, <clears throat> yeah, you, you save a lot of gas doing a ternary. Okay. Cool, let's go back. Um, is yeah. there anything else in base we should look at? I would actually be quite interested to see how they do their re entry lock. You can look at it. To consider dirty re entry lock. Dirty. Oh, it's not going to get dirty on us. <laughs> error contract lock, so pro, uh, custom error. Um, is locked equals one. Okay. So this is interesting that they're using a UN256 here. Uh, so I've stopped using bools because, uh, well, where I can. 
And instead, I use a U and eight that mm. is either zero or one. And if it's zero, that equals false. Yeah. Um, but they're using a two five six, um, which I think is kind of inefficient. But I, I really do back these people. Um, so we're basically. I really think that's inefficient, to be very honest with you. Maybe we should make a PR. <laughs> Uh, because it's only ever one or two, so it's never going to reach overflow if it's just a unit eight. Um, and then the modifier is, is not locked. And then if is locked not equal to one, revert contract lock, is locked equals two, and then proceed. And then mm. is locked equals one. Okay, cool. Thanks. I'm satisfied. I like that they made their own. Um, but it's interesting because I was like, it's interesting that they didn't use the open Zeppelin. Um, Reentrancy, um, non reentrancy modifier, but she is working at Open Zeppelin and she wrote her own one. So it, Open Zeppelin, they are, in a way are using the Open Zeppelin one. <laughs> <laughs> um, sweet. So let's start with the modifier. So, um, yeah, because we've already gone through the, the, the interfaces. Um, check deadline. So this is basically just making sure that the current time is not um, past the deadline. If it is, we'll revert with the transaction deadline passed and then constructors. So like you said, time, no state variables declared here that I can see. Um, mm -hmm. And they just send in the router param. So when we checked earlier, that's obviously all the, all the addresses of the different um, kind of marketplaces or addresses that they need for, mm -hmm. for, for, two performing, yeah, for performing swaps. Mm -hmm. um, so they send all those in and then they also send it into the Ruti Mutables um, contract. And yeah, cool. So uh, let's dig in. This is another thing I've been seeing in, in, in quite a few contracts. I don't love it. So on line 20, they say inherit doc, I universal router. So there's no mm -hmm. um, NAT spec here for this function. Oh, uh, do you have to look at it in the... You have to look at it in the interface. So... I'm not I don't, a fan of that either. I don't love that. I think you should have it everywhere, but some people say it's a lot cleaner. Um, it is cleaner, but like... Uh, so there's the errors, and then... Okay, cool. So um, this there's two executes. They're both external and payable. Obviously, one with the deadline and one without. Uh, executes encoded commands along with provided inputs. Reverts if deadline has expired. Um so it takes in commands, which is a set of concatenated commands. Because remember, we did A, B, we're using ABI yeah. in code, and then you yeah. can just go ABI and concat. Mm -hmm. And then an array of inputs, and then the deadline. Okay, so, yeah. Um, uh, I'm glad that you also don't like this inherit doc. Um, yeah, I think it's cleaner, like, where it actually belongs. So like I can understand, I can understand like taking custom errors and structs and stuff and putting those into interfaces um, to declog the, the actual contract itself. But like, I kind of feel like we need the NAT spec. I think it's so important. Yeah. Um, but each turn. So this execute is the same. It just calls this execute below, but it just has that check deadline, deadline um, yeah. modifier, which is quite a nice way to do it. I would have actually had a slightly different logic here, but you don't need it. It's, this is very optimized. Um, cool. Do you want to read this contract? Yeah, cool. Um, so oh, we're talking about the from line 30, right? Yes. Um, yeah. Cool. So yeah, taking the commands and the inputs, um, and then it does the is not locked kind of re entrancy check. I assume that's the re entrancy check. Um, yes. Yeah, then bool success, bytes, memory output. Okay, number of commands equals commands dot length. Um, interesting that they've done that. Uh, so I think that's actually just more gas efficient to create a local variable in the in the function. Mm. Um, that instead of calling commands dot length the whole time. Um, yeah, you but, do this a lot actually. Yeah, it's just more efficient, um, especially like especially if there's a state variable that you're calling multiple times. Mm. Just rather create a local variable in the function. Um, so if you have like an array or something like in your state variable uh, called like X, well, let's put say it in the function itself. Yeah, exactly. Um, um, so yeah, if this is the check that you were talking about, you were like, this must exist. 
Yes, they have to be the same length. Yeah. Um, so if inputs dot length does not equal number of commands, length mismatch, because obviously we have to have the same amount of inputs to commands. Um, so what I'm trying to think though is num commands. Sorry, I'm just quickly looking through how many times they actually use num because they okay, so they only use inputs dot length once. So that makes sense that they don't need to create a local variable for that. But they've used num commands twice, so you, you would save guess there. Okay, cool. Um, so they loop through all given commands, execute them, and pass along outputs as defined. So um, we loop through, obviously, for the length of how many commands there are. Mm -hmm. I notice that there's no command index plus plus. Oh, there, they're doing an unchecked. They do it in unchecked. Okay, cool. Very cool. Um, so but, part one, sorry, what's up? No, no, I'll, when we get there, I'll... Okay, cool. Um, but one is a command, uh, at command index. So it's basically just getting the current command, um, at position zero for the first loop. Uh, it gets the input at position zero. It mm. calls the dispatch method, which is basically what decodes and actually, um, performs the actual command. And then it returns the output and if there was a success or not. Um, and the success, um, is probably if it reverted or not yes to or the the revert. F. it might be the f it might be the flag oh yes it might be to do with that flag yeah um so anyway so then uh oh sorry success required i think will be the the flag the flag yes okay um so if so if it was the success if the success variable came back as false mm -hmm. so if it wasn't successful and oh that makes sense and the success required is also um, false, then it'll revert. But I assume then if the transaction came back as false, but they the success required was true, then it won't revert because it it would have kind of force pushed it anyway. Um, mm -hmm. So that if makes success sense. Success required was false, I think. In that if case. Uh, yes, false, because then it can just then push through. Just, yeah, Otherwise, if it is true, it had to happen. Yes. Um, then it just reverts with the command. And then, oh, this is quite cool. Um, it says command index, and then it references the actual variable. So you can, I don't know this, in a custom area, you can say some, like, you can say what the command index is that ex uh, that execute. I wonder why they're doing that. Execution. I think it's just more verbose. Mm, maybe. Um, so, and then this unchecked uh, command index plus plus, not plus plus, command index, interesting. Um, this is where I had a hypothetical. I mean, I'm sure they've thought about it, but let's say I have, I make a command that's enormous, like a command, like a concatenated command. So I have like thousands of swaps and, and, and all these things. And I wrap a lot of ETH. Then command mm -hmm. index plus plus might eventually overflow. Or is there a check somewhere that it's not above a certain uh, size or it just not let me by being. Is it not? Because they don't declare the size bytes, it automatically becomes like a bytes 32 or something. So you can't have more than that many commands anyway. Oh, I see. Um, I do think it defaults to bytes 32, yeah. Okay. So you wouldn't be able to have more than 32 commands. So I, I don't think it can overflow. Okay. I'm sure they thought that through. Yeah. Oh, he has the success required. Um... Oh, so it takes in a command. Oh, they are. That's the flag allow revert that's that flag that we're looking mm -hmm. at and interesting i love this i've been seeing this a lot and i i really enjoy it um you don't say like bool this and then return the bool you just say return just and then you return. Put the actual expression it's awesome mm. it's cleaner um so that's quite um, a clean contract actually yeah to think that this is the whole thing it's awesome yeah like that's very clean and they just use a whole bunch of stuff from other places. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, this is kind of what we were discussing internally the other day where we were like, it's nice to actually break things into little components and then put them together in one main contract. Exactly. Should we look at this rewards collector? Because I don't know what that does. I haven't seen mention of it anywhere. Yeah, why would they import something that they didn't need? Unless there's a... 
No, they don't use it, Joe. You're right. We didn't see any use of it here. Um, maybe we should go back and check that because I don't see why they would import something if before we look into it. Let's just check if they because they are definitely using it. No. They do not use it. Okay. So then if we go back to contracts and base. And also callbacks. I don't know where that gets used. Oh, you know, dispatcher might use callbacks. Yeah. Mm. But I don't understand. So that's also why. Oh, it, mm. it could be a way for them to get roots and mutables in. Oh, another thing. No, but they already bought um, that in. They already. Yeah, rewards collector is roots and mutables. But then here, they in import roots and mutables again. They don't need to. Because they've got it here. It is rewards. Exactly. So they're importing something to us. I think we need to create a little PR. A little PR yeah. with a couple of um, things, yeah. Yeah. The Salute Sea Friday's PR. I think we should. Um, let's see if we have time to even do it on the show. Otherwise, we can uh, make a little note and it could be part two or we can just do it and on Salute Sea Friday's Twitter just tell people what we did if it gets yeah merged big if big um but yeah so they don't use rewards collector um just trying to see what it is it's yeah um safe transfer library for esc20 okay so th this wouldn't work for rebasing tokens the swap swap library then yes safe transfer lab doesn't actually look doesn't work for rebasing tokens only um i recently learned uh reward sent event error unable to claim Oh, let's go to our rewards collector because we Wait. need to see the inherit doc. Wait. Oh, this is only for looks rare. Mm, yes. Do they not use any of that? Do they not use that? No, they don't use the unable to claim mm -hmm. error in. Wait, let me look. That could be it. Because it has to be like, I can't see them importing something that they didn't use. Oh, they don't. No. Like, okay. Cool. I actually want to go to the interface and see this um, inherit doc and looks rare rewards collector implements a permissionless call to fetch looks rare rewards earned by universal router users and transfers them to an external rewards distributor contract. Notice fetches users looks rare rewards and sends them to the distributor contract. That's it. It's also interesting that only looks rare gives rewards. Um, maybe some alpha for people who want to <laughs> get NFTs and aren't sure which market plays. Yeah. <laughs> um, but then it sends it to a distributor contract. Where's that? Mm, where is that? Good, good question. So let's see what it does. Okay, so... Where does it get this looks rare rewards distributor? Oh, it might be in recent. That's from post. immutables, yeah. Okay. Or looks rare claim, full success. So it obviously returns a few things, but we're just interested in just the success. And if success is false, revert unable to claim. Otherwise, UN two five six balance looks rare token dot balance of address this looks rare token dot transfer. Rule, router rewards distributor. Oh, so you transfer the balance it to, to the, the distributor. Rewards distributor. So this must be a looks rare contract, and it's just an address mm. that they yeah. have in their router immutables. And then it just re emits reward sent. So it's okay. actually sending it to the distributor contract on behalf of the user. Well, from this contract, but to the distributor. So the does the user get the rewards here? Do they have to claim it from the distributor contract? I think they have to claim it from the distributor contract. I almost want to um, go to Ruto Immutables. Um, so these addresses, <clears throat> where did I set it? Uh, I see they just pass it in, so. Yeah. Um, Okay, I think I might go on Etherscan and try to find that 
the dress after this and just see what it does. That would be interesting. Cool. So we've looked at all this. Um, should we look at callbacks? I don't know where it gets used. Um, oh, these are just your um, NFT receivers. Mm. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, we've seen this kind of stuff before. It's interesting. Some of their contracts are greater than uh, Pragma 0 0.8.17, but some of them are greater than 15. Like Rewards Collector. Hmm. That is interesting. Oh, uh, maybe um, Looks Rare Rewards Distributor is a 0 0.8.15 contract. Yeah, that's probably why. Cool. Because they um, want to make it compatible. Yeah. Um, I think we've looked at basically everything. Um, what could be interesting to look at is um, where's their foundry.toml? Is yeah. this a foundry? Oh, it's it's ts.conf. Oh, wait, there's remapping.txt. Yeah, I see that via IR is true. That's why they can have such a big struct. So that's a nice yeah. tip. I mean, I'd, I wouldn't advise doing this if you can avoid it, but if you need a big struct with lots of addresses, which is quite a big data type, then if you're using Foundry, which I would recommend you switch to, uh, if you set via hmm. IR to true, it increases the stack size. Wow, look how many optimizer runs they did. Oh my word. That's a lot. Oh, and then this is this is what we learned last week, FMT, that's the uh, linter. Yeah. Oh yes, we saw that in the permit. Hmm. We still haven't seen them use permit. Oh, oh, it's under here. Um, thanks. Good catch. Maybe that can be what we do next. And then I think, where is it? Uh, it was libraries, I think. No. Um, so there's payments and then there's permit to payments. Cool. Um, I don't know what safe class 160 is. Um, do you? Obviously, it costs a 126 into a 160. I mean, a, a 256 into a 160 safely. But... Dropped off there. Sorry. That was weird. Did you drop off or did I? No, I dropped off. Oh, I was just saying, I don't know what the safe class 160 is, but it must just cost this into a 160 for some reason safely. <laughs> um. Cool. From address is not owner is the error. And then, um, cool. Performs a tr transfer from on permit two. So they go to permit two transfer from, okay, it just goes permit two dot transfer from. Where is permit two defined? It, it might be in payments. Did you drop off again? No, no, no. Sorry. Uh, I'm kind of in and out. Uh, no, they just have pay and pay portion. Sweep. Oh, here's sweep. Sweeps all of the contracts ERC20 or ETH to an address. Uh, oh, okay. So it's not what we it. thought. Um, interesting. And then you can do the same for 1155s and seven uh, ones. And then here's the wrap ETH, unwrap ETH9. So I'd actually like to see their wrap function. Okay, it's just a normal wrap. But... Um, Where does this get used though? So this gets used in pay, permit two. Um, but yeah, it says permit two dot transfer from. But where's permit two defined? Constants? Oh, constants. Okay. Which is, oh, it's an address. Okay, cool. But how can you call transfer from on an address? I don't think oh, it's that's an because that's what permit two does. Oh, uh, yes. Okay. It has its own transfer from. We're, we're, think, we're used to going like USDC dot transfer from. Yeah. But it, this is a different kind of transfer from. Yeah, token. Yeah, so okay. you transfer from to amount and token. Okay, cool. And then here's the batch transfer from. Pay or permit to transfer from. Interesting. Um, either performs a regular payment or transfer from on permit to, depending on the pay address. Um, okay, cool. And then they go amount dot two units 160. Only for if they're doing a permit to transfer from. Crazy. Um, 
actually quite hectic uh, like all of this like a lot of different know. parts i don't like this it's all in one line <laughs> if payer equals dress paid okay. <laughs> is that kidding the ocd yeah yeah <laughs> it <laughs> sure is um okay cool so this is how they use permit two um it's that simple but remember we need to approve permit two um if we go to Uniswap yeah, that's docs. the first thing that happen, has to happen. But where do we? Where do they do that? Um, oh. Actually, let's just try find it in the code. They don't do it in in the actual. Um, Universal router where I thought they would maybe under deploy. Uh, oh, interesting. So these are for unsupported uh, protocols. Uh, this that's is just a pullback. to ensure reverts on attempted to protocols on a given okay. unsupported on a given chain. So then this they can add. I don't know, like other marketplaces later. Yeah, but it's just also so that if someone tries to send to an unrecognized marketplace, it just has a fallback error. Yes, which is nice. Very nice. Um, have we looked at recipient at all? No. Uh, no if recipient oh, it just gets the recipient address for a command. Okay. That's chilled. Okay, so I still don't know where they are approving permit to. Maybe the user has to. Mm, no, but that kind of defeat the point, won't it? Because you might as well just approve. Hmm. I'm not sure. Tests. Yeah, tests are inside contracts. They they have tests outside as well, but then they also have a chair. Um, wouldn't mind seeing some of the tests. Oh, these are that that I almost feel like test utils. Um, should we look Let's at? Let's go to one of their test modules. They're just functions that revert or uh, emit events. Reentering protocol. And the other test? They're actual tests. Mm, I'd like to see that. Brad, we might only have time for one, unfortunately. Universal router.t, that's all. Set up. Oh, they set their params. Oops. So they're just setting everything to address zero, basically, for now. Okay, fair enough. Oh, that's very interesting. Because also, at permit two, you know the address. You could just test with it really on a yeah, fork. I'm not sure why they're doing that. But I'm sure they'll set it at some point. Um, well, they have a SAMD in their tests. <laughs> oh, my word. Okay. Test sweep token. Okay, cool. So let's see that. Um, so it so encodes the first the sweep command. Into a unit. It, it, it takes the sweep command, casts it to a unit 8, casts it to a unit byte. Eight, back to bytes 1. Yeah, and then encodes it. Interesting, because this is actually less than, why they do this, I think, is this is actually, you can remember, five bits. It's not a byte yes, one. It's less. Exactly. So then they cast it to a unit eight, it pads, and then they now it can be cast to a byte one. Then they exactly. input it packed. That's cool. Inputs, yeah. Size one, input zero, ABI encode, address ESC20 recipient amount. ESC20 address router amount. Okay, cool. So we're just minting this to ourselves, actually, in this case. Because we address zero. We set equal the balance before is zero of recipient, yeah. Yeah, then they want to execute a sweep. Yeah. And now we know a sweep just sends the funds straight away. Yeah. So then um, now it should sweep and now the balance should be amount. amount. Okay. Of the recipient. Okay, just wait, go up quickly. So where does this where do you tell no wait, back to the test, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Where like where do you say who gets the sweep? In this so oh, there yeah, that's the, so those are the in, yes. um, they're the they parameters a... for the sweep. 
Um, no, I think the recipient no, probably gets defined in oh address ten. Yes. Yeah, but what I'm saying is recipient is okay. So I forgot that inputs is the parameters for the command. Yes. Yes. So the parameters are we sweeping address ERC twenty to the recipient and a and certain amount. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Sweet. Um, cool. And those cool. ones. Um, sweet ETH. Sweet ETH. Um, sweep eleven fifty five. Not full amount. Interesting. Oh, this is. I think. Wait, you'll probably have that flag. Oh no, I don't see them put the flag though. Um, I thought they would have had a flag here because they don't sweep the full amount. So I thought maybe it would have reverted, but they allow. I want to push it through, control, yeah. yeah. And then they have support. So they're only it. testing the sweep stuff. Yeah, weird. Weird, weird. Interesting. Um. Unless maybe wow. under integration tests, because they have foundry tests and then they also have integration tests, and then they might have. Oh, oh wow. no. yeah, there we go. No, but that's just integrating with the. Oh yeah, uh... and it's in TypeScript. Lately, when I see this language, my mind switches off because we're doing so much solidity with foundry, but I need to get better in TypeScript. Hectic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Rad. Um, I think that's. Uh, all we have time for already and we i think we finished it again we're, we're Dude, quite we, on a roll we are doing so well so let's see fridays notoriously doesn't finish the code that we show uh, <laughs> just because um, we understand it so well Tan. Mm, definitely not because <laughs> um, uh, that's funny yeah oh, and then they do. where's map unsupported um must be one of these things they import awesome thanks everyone um that's been another episode of solidity fridays brought to you by linum labs and thanks for joining thanks for having me yeah, yeah thanks for having me that's cool